privilege to kind of kick the ball down the field for 2021. 2020, for all of us, I think, was probably a year that will live on in infamy for many, many reasons. Some personal, some familial, some community, some national reasons. And um, I decided tonight to take the passage that we are in. Now, for those of you who are visitors tonight, it really is great to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, it is easier to just log on to John Mark or to John Tyson or Mark Sayers or some other cool, sexy, young preacher man or woman. But to come out here in the cold, we've even got heaters for you, trying to convince you this is a sweet space. But thanks for being here. And we are in the tail end. We are landing our examination of Mark's gospel. There are four Jesus stories in the scriptures. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John each give us a completely different vista of this Jesus story with some overlap. And we've been spending some months looking at this. And we are trying to land it by the first Sunday in January. Valentine's Day we will be in a new series. But tonight my privilege is to look at Mark 12. And it's been such a long gap since we last looked at it. I thought, oh, what do we do? What do we do? I'm not Francis Chan. I can't pull out the super prophetic thingy uh, out of a hat. Um, but, but we can explore the idea of resolution. Resolution. What and how can we engage in 2021 when 2020 really was a year of survival? All of us hung on with white knuckle perseverance. We wanted to see it end. Um, and end it did, and it ended fairly cataclysmically, as you know, last week. Well, I suppose that's the beginning of 2020, the, um, the assault on our nation's capital, whichever line on the po political thing you lie, that happened. And uh, I just thought, you know, Lord, in my prayer time, I can just exegete the text and act as if nothing happened, act as if nothing is happening. Or we can take this beautiful passage and use it and conversate around the idea of resolu re resolution, some new year ideas. So I went and googled millennial resolutions. That was fun to find what popped up that some of the resolutions that some of you apparently have, which was very curious and very intriguing. Um, but, but I thought this was a, a very beautiful passage to kind of align ourselves a little bit. I don't know about you. It was very difficult last year to keep true north spiritually. Politically, we were in all sorts of chaos, confusion and conflict. Socially, lots of isolation, separation. Uh, we were chatting with Meryl's parents in South Africa. They hardly see anyone uh, because they're in their 80s. Dad's 88, mum is 84. And um, the, the, the rest of the clan kind of really rallies around them to protect them because COVID is going crazy in South Africa. In fact, today, Sunday afternoon, one of kind of our dear friends, but more friends of our siblings, passed away, 45 years old, amazing man, Jesus lover, and died of COVID. And the funeral was this afternoon. So, so there's the social confusion and complexity because... We can't be together and do everything we love doing together. Then there's the economic vulnerability. Of course there is. Many people losing their jobs, many uncertainties. What will happen? What is happening? Will I have a job? Will I leave college and come out with a job? Will we as a community continue to exist? And I just want to tell you with a father's heart, there were moments last year I really pounded the throne of heaven on behalf of our community. There were times I just don't, did not know that we would make it. We're a young community in age, and we're a young community. We've only been together three and a half years. And so there aren't time, there hasn't been time to really build deep, solid, substantial relationships that can ride roughshod over these moments. And the isolation, I, I, uh, on a Thursday morning, I meet with church planters here in Costa Mesa. So on Thursday, we went to get coffee, grabbed a co coffee, and then walked castaways, chatted, prayed. And, and one of the guys said, I've not been able to verify it, that the highest incident of suicide right now is amongst teenage girls. I'll comment on that a little bit later. So these are incredibly difficult times. Medically, of course, Justin's here. He's a doctor. Austin, rather, is a doctor. 
And uh, these guys and gals are frontline. My daughter, who's a nurse in Australia, we were uh, FaceTiming with her last night, our time. She was leaving for work Sunday afternoon to go and work in a pediatric ward. And she was just sharing some of the stories that they are facing there. And Perth is fairly COVID free, but some of the medical challenges. And then, as I said, spiritually, it's been a difficult time to try to keep true north. You know, we haven't had the privilege of community and fellowship and, and times together and reading the scripture. So this has been absolutely beautiful. So grab your Bibles, go to Mark 12, and we're going to dive in around the conversation of uh, resolutions into the new year, restoring true north. Mark chapter 12, if you're not that acquainted with the Bible, go to the middle of the book, turn right, keep turning until you find a little 16 chapter book that I personally really love. And I want to highlight the middle of the chapter for just a moment. There are 44 verses and we're going to go to verse 29. The most important one, answered Jesus. So some clever people came, some lawyers. Some lawyers came and said, okay, what's the most important commandment? We've got you. We guaranteed we're going to blow you out. The what are we going to expose you for the fraud that you really are? And so Jesus answers phenomenally. And he says, the, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all. I love that word. The allness of Scripture. It's a full-bodied craft beer. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon that is fully uh, invested with all of the berries that give it this full palated taste. It's that whiskey from Scotland or, um, that, that just fills you. You hear what I'm saying? It's this incredible full-bodiedness. The allness of the Bible. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What a way to start the new year. If we make it our passion, and listen, love, Meryl and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary at the end of November. Um, and we went to slow, it's a bit awkward because our 30th wedding anniversary was in Paris. To go to San Luis Obispo after Paris, it's like, really? is isn't nearly as compelling as I hoped it would be. But hey, it's the best we could do. We had a fabulous few days. Uh, God was so kind to us. And then um, we went away for the New Year's weekend to Sedona and with friends. And they, for Meryl's birthday, she's the first of the year baby and uh, they we went into a hot air balloon that's what their gift to Meryl was that we went in this hot air balloon and I have to tell you I was a complete wuss there are times I lean on my military background there are times I lean on my marathon running background to, to impress everyone how strong I really am I have to tell you I was the wuss in the basket these girls were leaning over the edge taking pictures and I want to grab my darling wife of 40 years and pull her back in because doesn't she know that we are this far away from eternity. It's a little hole in a little jolly basket flying who knows how high in the sky that will take us to meet our maker. Now, why am I telling you that silly story? Partly so that you know what we've been doing, but partly because love is the old songwriter said is a many splendid thing love is never passive love is never passive love is either something we invest in intentionally and continuously and we grow it we nurture it like um, what do the japanese do with their little plants exactly what is it yeah, the bonsai tree. It needs continuous affection and attention. You are continuously towering yourself over it, nipping away at the dead or the vulnerable and allowing the new to come through. Love is not an emotion that is fleeting. It is not a memory that holds me in yesterday. It's an ongoing daily practice in which I use my words and my thoughts and my imagination. And I use my ideas to keep nurturing, keep the fire kindled in my 40-year marriage. That's the idea Jesus says. You, you, you want to love God? Love Him like that. I look at some of you, and I honestly, I have such a, an incredible affection for our community. 
But investment into loving God is super zero. Don't really read the Bible. Don't really worship. Don't really fellowship. Oh, I don't know if God's real. Of course you don't. Of course you don't. Because if you had a marriage like that, you'd be divorced in two years. If you had friendships like that, they'll probably drain and drift away. The love here is an intentional investment because I want this to be the most beautiful thing on the planet. Why do I love Jesus after 43 years? Because I have loved Him. And the amazing thing is the more I love Him, He gives me back wave upon wave of grace and mercy and kindness and faithfulness and loyalty. And He nurtures me. And I feel like I grow as the Son of the Most High God. I offer Him a little seed and He gives back to me this ever-growing, fruit-filled uh, citrus tree or whatever the case may be. Do you understand the, the, the resolution, the core component of a year with Jesus, a year in which I grow is a year where I make this my highest priority. Every day I wake up and this is not for reasons of arrogance or boastfulness. It's because I love him with all of my heart and I open the Bible and you'll see it's scribbled with heaps of red lines. And I find just the simple introduction in my journal, Morning Father. That's all I write to start with. And then He loves me. What a way to have a true north. No, nothing else. No, no, no job can give me true north. No relationship can give me true north. No check can give me true north. No microphone that doesn't always work can give me true north i love the lord with all of my heart all of my passion you know <laughs> some of us are so restrained during our worship times my son who as many of you know is at university in san diego and uh, when he comes back pre-covid from a mosh pit in, in la or coachella Oh, I'm so hoarse, Dad. Oh, we hardly slept. Where were you? Oh, you should have seen childish, what, whatever it can be. You should have seen. Oh, oh, oh. And I'm like, really? You do that? And I mean, we have a great relationship. There's not a criticism with him. It's just a curiosity. My God who saves me is faithful and loyal and cares for me and nurtures me and sustains me and heals me and loves me and cares for me. That is who you are. That is who you are. Really? Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light up. It just bubbles. All of my heart. All of my heart. Imagine a date with Meryl. I'm sorry I'm belaboring the point. Imagine a date with Meryl and I'm like, yeah, I really, I really love you. Yeah, yeah, let's just. Let's get a burger in and out, you know, cool date night. Yeah, no, 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 you put the card on the table and you go and hit a fancy restaurant and you look into her eyes and I turn her so she can't see everyone else because then I lose my prophetic wife and she looks at me with those gorgeous brown eyes. You see, because loving is investing with all of my heart, with all of my mind. My mind is preoccupied by the beauty, wonder and mystery of who He is. With all of my soul, my spirit is alive because He has saved me. I'm born again by His precious blood. All of my strength. All of my strength. And then I love my neighbor as I love myself. Listen, I have to comment on this week. You know what's tragic for me? I read an article, I don't think as a journalist, but not a believer, I don't think. And his, the essence of his article was, it is up to the church to change the essential abandoned radicalism of some Christians, something along those lines. Can I say this? I don't really care which side of the political divide you are. I could neither vote for Trump nor Biden. That's my disclaimer. I scratched my vote. I don't feel either of them represent Jesus that I could with any confidence say he's my man or woman. Just that's my disclaimer. But this yardstick, you love your neighbor as you love yourself, is the Christian's response to the time in which we live. Not anger, resentment, division. 
not a hatred, bitterness. Love my neighbor as I love myself with dignity, with respect, with honor. Are you with me? I think the greatest testimony we can offer the world and that charge of the capital set the church back heaps. I don't know if we will recover. Not anytime soon. The testimony of the church. I don't even want to say I'm an evangelical. When people speak about us, this is what I want them to say. They love their neighbor as they love themselves. Okay? Now, there are four things in the rest of the chapter that I'm going to touch on ever so briefly. That's why I've got the clock on myself. The first is the first part of the story uh, from verses 1 through until 12. And it's the story Jesus tells of a, of a man who buys a field. He, 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 he lays some vines, he puts up a watchtower, he, he has a, a wine press, all of that going, all of that going. And then harvest time, when the money is due, he sends his servants to get the money and the servant is beaten up. He sends another servant. The servant gets killed. He does several more until such time as he says, the only person I have left to send is my beloved son. That's the story. That's the Jesus story. Now, if we're in the conversation on resolution, how can we attract any sense of 2021 from this? Here's my thesis. In verse 7, it said, But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. Here's my suggestion. What if we make one of our primary resolutions for 2021, I will trust him. You see, they couldn't trust the owner of the land. They couldn't trust the farmer. They couldn't trust to get their share. So what they did is they beat them up. They killed them. They destroyed the messenger. I think, and I will be very brief on this one, one of the great gifts we can offer to God at the throne of grace is to say, God, I want to trust you more this year with my inheritance. That means with my future, what you've prepared for me, what you have in store for me. Do you have a house for me? Do you have a marriage for me? Do you have a, a cool job for me? Do you have an opportunity to serve the poor, go on mission? Whatever is there, I want to trust you fully. I want to open these little sticky hands of mine and say, I will trust you. Within the core component of loving the Lord and loving your neighbor comes that first kind of angle. And that is to be able to trust God for your inheritance. Don't kill Jesus in your life. No, no, Chris, I'll, I'll never do that. Well, well, how do you kill him? How do I kill him? When I don't trust him, because I'm not really sure God is for me. I'm not really sure. And so I will take control of my own inheritance, because I'm not sure he has a good one for me. We'll linger on that thought, thought number two. The second passage from 13 through uh, 17 is the imperial tax one. Now, most of you who've read the Bible knows, know this. The, the priests and the lawyers come to him and say, uh, must we pay Caesar what is his due? They give him a denario, and Jesus says this, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, give unto God what is God. Now, I don't want to really labor on that much, but I want to read a few verses earlier on. It said, they came to him and said, teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now I pick up with my introduction earlier on. I think this is a beautiful piece. What if each one of us said, Lord Jesus, I would love you to transform me. That when people speak of me or us, this is what they say. You are a man or a woman of integrity. What you say and how you behave are exactly the same thing. There's no ounce or inch of light between words spoken and life lived. And that's what the gospel does. The gospel transforms me into his image and his likeness. Oh, we know you're Christians. You're a bunch of angry people. No, we're not. We're a bunch of integrous people. Oh, no, no, no. We know you Christians. You just mob violence. 
It was so funny. We bought a surfboard, long story, and I went to get fins in Huntington Beach yesterday. So I could not believe it, quite honestly. I'm standing at the point where Main Street and PCH meet. And there are, hmm, 40 Trump supporters. Now again, I'm not for or again, that's not my angle right now. And cars honking and hooting as they went past. Sorry, hooting is a South African term for honking. Lest you think it means something else. But the word here is, you are a man of integrity, and you, Jesus, are not swayed by others. When that pastor said to me on Thursday, to us on Thursday, that teenage girls have the highest incident of suicide in Orange County right now, and I say that in quotation marks because I haven't verified it, I was traumatized by that thought. You see, the problem is that what has happened to many is that TikTok, Instagram, and the rest have created a sway of influence in which we buy into the lie that others sell on the social media platform. I'm not against it. But, but I think what happens is that all too easily we are drawn into listening to the narrative that's given to us, believing we aren't living that story. And then living with the anger and the bitterness and the resentment of woe is me. You know, I heard a 12-year-old speak at her dad's funeral today. 12 years old. Her dad was a remarkable man. Kind man. Very wealthy. Very generous man. Died at 45 or 46, I think. And this girl spoke about her dad with such affection and confidence. Dad, you did this. Dad, you did this. Dad, I, 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 I'm glad that you are with Jesus, Daddy, and I will miss you every day. I mean, I'm sitting there in tears. In South Africa, we are watching the video. See, here's someone who, at least as of yet, has not been allowed. She's not allowed herself to be swayed by others. He can stand up in a public platform with loads of people there and honor her father and speak well of her father and think with gratitude to her father. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our news of our news resolution is the transformation that allows us to look like this, that we pay no attention to the pressure to conform that is external, that confuses my gender, my, my, my sense of sexual fluidity. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. Um, what if the truth, the way of God in accordance with the truth is what penetrates my soul. Okay, two more and I am done. The first, remember we said is trusting in our inheritance. The second is transformation through the gospel. The gospel can change me to be this kind of person. Thirdly, they asked Jesus, the Sadducees do, now tell me, and the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, but they asked him, now tell me, a woman dies, by law she's got to marry her husband's brother. He dies, got to marry the next brother seven times. In eternity, this is like a super cute question. In eternity, whose wife will she be? And Jesus makes this really amazing reply. He says in verse 24, Are you not in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God? We started this reading the scripture as a community. I want to invite you back into that. It takes a little bit of time. It does. But, but Jesus' reply was, you don't know the text and you don't know the power of God. What if a resolution for 2021 includes trust and transformation and the power of the text? I want to read this beautiful book that has transformed people for thousands and thousands of years, that has kept people anchored got an email from a friend of mine in Kyrgyzstan, American guy who lives there and takes the gospel to these beautiful people. I spoke to a man from Bahrain this week, Tuesday, and he was sharing with me what God's doing in Iran. It's the fastest growing spiritual Christian conversion in the world right now. Jesus appearing to men and women 
They have no Christian frame of reference. They sit on their Persian rugs, eat their Persian food, and share and pray together around the Messiah. This was a conversation I had on Tuesday. Why? Because this, dare I say irreverently, silly little book. What power can a book have? Full of stories we hear at Christmas and Easter. Transformative power. The text and the Spirit of God. Lastly, thank you. I've gone a little over according to what I'd hoped, but my last one. Let's recap. Trusting that He will provide me an inheritance. Transformation by the gospel as we hear it and we preach it. Thirdly, the text and the power of God. And the last little story in this chapter, Jesus goes to the treasury, the temple treasury where people bring their offerings. And he watches and there's a poor widow who comes and puts in two small copper coins worth only a few cents, I read. Calling his disciples to him, he said, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow was put, has put more in the treasury than all of these. So all these wealthy people come in and put their big checks in. And she puts in two little copper coins and the disciples say, What are you talking about? She put in a couple of coppers. They gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. The last thing I want to say to us, what about our resolution in the area of our finances? You know, I taught my kids and the three churches that I've led, our finances are quite simple. When you get your bi-weekly or weekly check or monthly check, which is my preference, the first thing is you do is you give 10% to the church. Yep, that's, you heard right. I believe that with all of my heart. 10% off the top. Why? Because it allows us to do this. Funny story. I've been feeling God say, the family needs a home, meaning we as a community need a base. I'm not compelled by buildings, really. I find them an irritant most times. But out of the blue, I feel, and I share it with the staff on Tuesday, I feel like God wants us to have a home. The family needs a home. So, Thursday afternoon, a businessman calls me. Now, only the staff know this. Dana and Stu, at least Dana and Tyler. Sorry, I'm rushing. Sam's not there. And um, I said, I just feel like we need a home. So, Thursday afternoon, a businessman calls me. He says, I don't know if you're interested, but I want to get a warehouse in Costa Mesa. Would you and the church want to join me? I'm like, okay, Lord, you are onto something. Out the blue, no one knows. Friday, I sit with the pastor for coffee at, at uh, Fashion Island. And about three quarters of the way through the conversation, he leans forward and he looks at me and says, you know, you have to get a building now. I'm saying, shut up. Shut up. See, how do we do that? We do that because we're all generous together. That's what our tithing does. It empowers us to do what we need to do and the other bits and pieces. But then we take 10%, I tell my kids, and we, we save it. And it doesn't matter, it feels, I feel so small, $20, I mean, yep, you put it in and you save it. Good steward, giving God opportunity to grow it. And then 10%, a life of generosity, you can live on 70%. We've done it a long time. 10%, you live a life of generosity. What a great opportunity to just say, here we go. Go and have a meal on me. Get some groceries. We'd love to just bless you. You know who are stumped the most by those acts are rich people. Because they never expect you to bless them. They're always the ones that people go to to get. I love, almost, it's almost awkward, like, why are you doing this? Because I said, to be a truly generous person, you've got to learn to give and to receive. If you can't receive, you're not generous. See, I think this, if I can apply it to resolution, is God giving us opportunity at the beginning of the year to set our finances in order. Make sure that we're giving God opportunity. Closing story. I, I got a new financial advisor and a young guy in his 30s and he says to me okay chris let's sit down and budget so i said look 
can, can we just have an honest conversation quickly? I said, I don't budget. And, and he looked at me at his pad. He flipped his pad closed. And I believe in budgeting, just not for me. And uh, so, so he said, well, what do you mean? I said, I believe in faith. I said, Josh, this is what I do. And I laid it out for him. Listen, when I got to the 10% savings, he was super happy. He opened his file again and started making notes saying, okay, well, I can help you with that. What a great way to start the year. To say, okay, Lord, I'm going to love you with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength. I'm not going to flirt with you. I'm not going to splash my life with a little bit of Jesus. I'm in allness. Allness. I want to love you with all that I have. I'm going to be proactive, intentional, front-footed, loving you in any and every way that I can and watch the overriding tsunami that fills me in return with your love, goodness, kindness. And then out of that, we can trust Him for the inher inheritance we long for. We can allow the gospel to transform us that we become just like Jesus. That when they speak of us, they don't speak of an angry mob or a disengaged passive community. A man full of integrity, a woman. Not easily swayed by the opinions of others. Not drawn by the convictions of the many. And then lastly, like the widow, say, Jesus, it's all yours. Do with it whatever you want. Can we pray together? I thank you, precious Father, for this incredible community. I know in my haste I may have said some things that haven't completed the idea, that may have misrepresented you or the Bible, and I apologize for that. But I ask tonight at the beginning of this new year that, that you will really get a hold of us. Invite us into a journey. 2020 was a year of survival, 2021 a year of expectation. That we lean into you and we partner with you on great adventures. We invite you into our hearts. We invite you into our lives. Right the wrongs. The things that slipped into last year that were really unhelpful. Right those. And allow us to live this new life, this new year, with the resolutions that are directed at you. And watch and see what you will do. What I'd love you to do, we have got about five minutes or so. Most of you, I think a few of you are sitting alone, and I honor and respect that. But those of you who are comfortable to be a little closer... Do you mind just praying for each other? You don't have to say, this is my resolution or this is what spoke to me tonight. But just pray for each other. We all need that prayer that God will realign us this year. Kind of the spiritual chiropractor. Take a moment, would you mind? And then we'll land it together.